Hello everyone, today we talk about the Almoravids and the Halmohads, these Islamic Berber dynasties that came to rule over important parts of northwestern Africa and of the Iberian Peninsula, in the latter especially uh, taking over the uh, uh, Muslim uh, Emirates of the Taifas that had formed after the disgregation of the Caliphate of Cordoba. And uh, there are many reasons why this um, movements are interesting, if anything, you, you can read um, a lot into them, both from a, of course, politically, but also militarily and, and religiously, right? And what, what is that triggered these uh, new uh, waves of, of conquest from uh, from an area that, you know, historically, it's not what we, we remember otherwise, but it's historically, like, Northwest Africa never, never brought to this you know, ex exploit, let's say, that we're able eventually to, to reach as far as uh, as the Ebro Valley. And and so it's important, first of all, to understand what was the Iberian uh, context. Uh, it's also important to stress that, you know, the Almoravids managed also to score important victories on Christian armies, respectively, at the Battle of uh, Sagrayas and Alarcas. We were talking about the latter, incidentally, talking to one of the last videos that we made about the Reconquista and observing the also during the pontificate of Innocent III is coming back that would bring to Las Navas and so this heavy blow that would in fact crush the Halmohad power um, in um, let's say as a, as a consequence also a, you can argue as a if not a military reformation at least a reorganization of uh, the Christian Iberian powers after these you know important waves um, of uh, Islamic coming back that at the time were, were still you know considering that just in 1187 uh, Jerusalem had fallen to Saladin it seemed to you know um, pose a, a new threat to the integrity the territorial integrity of Christianity uh, and um, the, um, the 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 key here that I would like to to use to to interpret this phenomenon that we will make uh, videos on again uh, something also more general than today's one, at least in, in outlook, even eventually speaking, to, to have some coordinates, is the religious one, the spiritual one, right? That is that triggered properly these movements that um, fundamentally mean also in, um, in Arab, uh, as these peoples had come to be historically uh, Islamicized in the previous centuries from, from the ninth fundamentally, and imperfectly so, Right to decide to reinvigorate their own uh, faith, their own uh, what they saw as their own orthodoxy at that point, and embracing especially the Malikid school of uh, the Sharia. That, as you know, th there are different uh, schools uh, of thought in Islam, and uh, the latter fundamentally was um, a, a a literalist one. Right, it was a, a, a traditionalist one based on a fact literal interpretation of the Quran and of, of the Hadiths that uh, integrated any kind of, of gap that could eventually form in the, you know, in, in juridical practice by looking at the customary tradition of Mecca, right? And the reason why uh, Malikism was uh, integrated in, in, say, was adopted in North Africa in northwestern Africa, um, in this area that was somewhat also the uh, the, the last <coughs> the least perfectly converted, right? You know that Maghreb is in uh, in the Islamic literature. Think about um, a thousand and a night, where the the, the the you know the evil wizard that comes from from this still quasi pagan background, where he's always in the west. So it's something similar, a reminiscent of that, even particularly partly in Christendom. I mean the the French. And the German crusaders that encountered, for example, the southern Normans of, of Sicily were somewhat suspicious also of the contamination that uh, living next to, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the Arabs and the, the Jews and the Orthodox Christians, aside from just also the, the Roman Catholics in, in, in Sicily, would be some, some sort of uh, depraving force. They, they, were, they called them the Batak, the Poulain, right? And so um, Islam had essentially the same opinion in Northwest Africa that uh, compared, obviously, to to Egypt, that was instead the you know the, the cradle of an important civilization, properly of a state. At this point, the uh, the Fatimids, the the Ayyubids had created um, 
a power that was also very much, um, let's say, more similar to, to Western powers in, in character and in, in socialization than, say, the, uh, the heavily feudalized and persified and, uh, in the sense, nomadic biased Seljuk uh, Sultanate. And so the, all the, you know, also probably a, a different military culture, as we've observed in, in their uh, organization more based on infantry rather than cavalry and so on, whereas West Africa had been, I mean, historically, it had been partly advanced. I mean, Difriki, yeah, think about Tunisia, uh, was, uh, I mean, let, let's, let, let's see the thing. I mean, the North Africa fundamentally is just a stripe of land, because in, in the interland you have Sahara, right, not just, you know, next next door, but, you know, there are essentially arid areas in um, in, in in the mainland, and the only importantly fertile area, in fact, is the one of Tunisia, where the also the, the Carthaginians, the Romans, uh, historically flourished and had, in fact, an important granary production. And also Morocco, that would be, in fact, the base of the, so, but quite consistently, you know, powerful on, on another side, with important cities on the coast of Algeria, also in the interland, partly. So these are not particular particularly underdeveloped areas and so um, especially the West the, the West African coast had um, always attracted you know think about the the gold of uh, of, of, of Senegal the, uh, the the caravan routes also the, the trans-saharian ones the, the slave trade uh, with the Mediterranean historically had always been particularly you know active in since the Middle Ages look at the savannas um, uh, lordships that were, you know, interesting powers also in terms of military organization, an important amount of cavalry. Um, and so when you look at the Berbers in the westernmost part, you realize that it was some important activity. There were some moral and, and material forces were put in, in action. So when we look at the Almoravids and the Almohads, we're essentially focusing on them. And yet these areas had been imperfectly Islamicized, so there was the, the awareness from the side of these peoples, especially the more they, they opened themselves to, uh, to Islamic culture by travel, by pilgrimage, mostly as, as Islam imposes, but uh, in this sense passing also through many other um, realities, right, including the same Muslim Spain, um, or Baghdad for, for that matter, had revealed the the locals, you know, the necessity to, you know, to improve, to reform, to, up, to update, the, uh, to perfect the, their faith, right, I, in a sense, because uh, these were mostly semi-nomadic communities, right, they didn't have much of a, of a subtle consistency, they didn't have properly the, the educational structures that you could find, I don't know, in the Middle East, with, you know, the development of uh, Islamic civilization, the exposure to great, the great romano Hellenic Romano-Hellenistic, um, you know, uh, legacy in culture, the libraries, urbanization, florid uh, basins like the Nile Valley, the Mesopotamia, and so on. So, uh, the Mediterranean itself. So, um, North Africa, of course, was exposed to the West heavily. So, what it was the, the point I was making before is that you know, North Africa demographically has always been insanely, you know, minoritary compared to uh, the southern shores of Europe. So. Um, at this point, I mean, still in, in antiquity, think about the, the Greek and eventually the influence and eventually the Roman conquest. So at this point, the, the Italians were, you know, had fundamentally taken over the Western Mediterranean and um, from, from the Saracens and were also dramatically present in all these various Muslim centers. They pushed forward also, in fact, to this southern uh, directions towards Central Africa because of, of the pressures of ivory, gold slaves and so on that were uh, you know very profitable assets to put their mineral and so these powers had gradually you know um, evolved right the the Islamic conquests had brought uh, to essentially an Arabicized elites were not properly an Arab one to essentially gather followings among the um, the Berber population so when we talk about the Arabs uh, the Arab invasions of the West or the Saracens, we're not actually talking about Arabs, we're talking mostly about Berbers, right? Uh, and um, the, um, however, you know, the Islamic conquest had, of course, uh, informed the local uh, and properly established local uh, Islamic political and social system, 
these peoples were in fact Muslim, aware of the the caliph, of the nature of caliphal authority, of the emerald one. So they played within that that system, and as it had been for the case of, of, of the Christianization of Europe, right? This was seen by the local elites as a profitable uh, opportunity to concentrate, to have a centralization of administration, some you know uh, permanent troops at some some level, at least the bodyguards, the retinues, or some resources to be able to control a more sedentary base. And so, um, also Ibn Khaldun that tells the story of these Berber waves in, properly in the, in the context of the Almoravid and the Almohad uh, succession, uh, speaks of this kind of uh, wild, uh, primitive south that was still somewhat warlike and tribal that uh, attacked the, the more stout of um, agricultural maritime north that you know was more florid and you know uh, at some point however these conquerors would soften up and be overwhelmed by yet another way um, so as I was saying before naturally understanding the nature of, of Muslim Spain at this point in the, the stage of the Reconquista is quite important but it's still a history of thought here that is important to stress because at the beginning of the uh, what we see here is is even internationally uh, uh, something you can't really say you know it had to happen for some reason of course there were some broader systemic let's say forces that would bring uh, if it hadn't been for the Almoravids or the Almohads later to to some kind of maybe of revivals or some kind of you know uh, uh, venting of these military let's say religious and, and, and military bigger that uh, Western Islam presented at this point. Um, uh, and in the second half of the 11th century, this force was able to substitute itself, or at least to take the leader, to, to, to substitute the elite, what had been the, uh, the declining, uh, I mean the, what the, the relics fundamentally of the Caliphate of, of Cordoba. So the peoples came literally from the Sahara, animated by a uh, criticism against the Muslim heresies against uh, of, of, of North of North Africa um, this is important because they as we were saying before the word they embraced um, um, uh, traditional Sunnism rigidly interpreted according to the Maliki doctrines what was the deal the deal was that uh, you know in order to put an end to this kind of a permanent state of heterodoxy but not ac of actual heresy as, as it happened Islam, for that matter, was enormously more messed up than Christendom at that time in terms of the diversity of all these various currents fighting against each other. To adopt, to put an end to, let's say, for that, at that stage of, you know, uh, of intellectual development, the, the, the Bedouins themselves, especially the Almoravids, were, right, they had, um, even their, the, their original tribe brought the name from, literally from these veils that they had in front of their faces, like the Tuaregs of of the desert um, to um, impose that literal list um, interpretation of the scriptures and as we've seen the integration with uh, the Meccan uh, customary law that had been however already crystallized by the 8th century by the founder of the Malachite school that had uh, you know f effectively mm, uh, supported himself with with that source of law um, and so this started from essentially single individuals traveling as we're saying in the in the Muslim world broadly went broadly meant including Cordoba so what had been the, the capital of the Iberian Caliphate and then also in, in, in the Near East and in, in Arabia um, and so on they had come back uh, in, uh, in, in North Africa essentially exposing this doctrine teaching it uh, having some following among some of these tribal um, forces and establishing in the case of the Almoravids properly this um, uh, ribat that was a fortress located in a Senegalese uh, island where these um, uh, Berber warriors would essentially uh, train both spiritually and uh, physically in, in preparation of the jihad in order to impose uh, the Islamic orthodoxy according to the Malachite school uh, to the um, to their neighbors right they started actually from within their same the, the pagans of their own their own same tribes they eventually uh, began to to compact power within 
these realities and um, to wage war to their neighbors, to, to areas that were still partly pagan, others that were Islamic but heretical. And more uh, broadly, um, let's say, criticizing eventually when they met with the realization that it was possible to cross into into Spain, uh, the, uh, what they saw as the morally decadent um, Muslim uh, you know, culture of, of Iberia, that uh, at that point was, say, in, uh, in open contrast, culturally speaking, even artistically, this is represented by the zoomorphic, anthropomorphic representations that, as you know, in Islam are, are forbidden. Um, because of, in fact, you know, this um, alleged distanciation from, from the, the Quranic uh, law, uh, and from the, uh, generally speaking, from this very strict, primitive, Spartan way of life that had been proper of the, you know, of, of the Muslims of the first hour from the, from the, you know, from the steppes. You can argue that, you know, were Bedouins, very, pretty much similar still. Um, to those times from from the Berber perspective and um, and so entering actually in an Iberian culture was more advanced than theirs and that for this reason would on the long run kind of reject or at least you know uh, would be impossible to to coerce on the base of such um, of such rigid interpretation of the Malachite doctrine and in fact uh, uh, simply um, the exposure from the side of the Berbers would essentially win, win them over on the longer run and making them softer and less, you know, warlike and essentially fragmenting once again. Uh, this is important because while, as we will see, the Almohads are praised as the, you know, kind of the peak of, of Islamic Berber culture historically because of their, um, you know, legal and theological inquiries and, and rationalistic and scientific approach, uh, and indeed, also for the, the greater amount of architecture and art, and s et cetera, that they, you know, they, they, they brought forward and say that the Almohad wave one century after the Almoravid one um, was less probably prorompent in, in nature, right? The, uh, the Almoravids managed eventually to, to take over this enormous uh, amount of land stretched from, uh, from Senegal to the Ebro Valley, right? So something you even see from the maps here is enormous extension. Of course, uh, it um, was already, you know, quite soon in, in internal crisis. It was uh, soon taken over by this other Berber movement from the, the same uh, uh, tribes of the mountains of, of, of the Atlas, guided by the Almohads later on. But it was definitely the greatest wave, the one that kind of scared the most, right? As we were saying before, um, they even managed to crash the uh, the Castilians, the Aragonese at the Battle of Sagrayas, to establish an imposant control um, of, of, of the situation for a while, continued for some generations. Not only their base was was not Cordoba, was Marrakesh, that they founded themselves and from there on remained eventually the capital of the same Almohads, eventually of the Marinids. Um, and so they were important for the development of the same uh, Morocco that remained that the main power in, in the area uh, fundamentally. Um, so the the name Al Moravid derives essentially from the aforementioned Ribat, and is to say those who inhabited the Ribat. So it's uh, Al Al Murabidun, right? So so from um, eventually was translated in Al Moravid uh, in the way we we, we use it, um, and. Uh, the the conquest uh, stretched as far as the Balearic Islands, uh, for example. That is interesting because it shows even a kind of a renewed even naval power of some sort. This is what the uh, Islamic Moroccan Moroccan powers would, would have for a long time. It would also, you know, while the, the Castilians even after the Navas by conquering these areas in, in the Atlantic and uh, close to, to Gibraltar Strait and so on, they never quite had for, for a long time in, 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 in capacity to, to contend um, to, to the Moroccans. Um, and so um, it's important to stress how uh, intransigent, however, the, the Almoravid uh, rule was, and that was, in, in a sense, both the cause of their success, 
because they objectively were uh, led by very capable uh, military commanders that had really a broad vision, a great motivation, and surely had informed this uh, this movement that uh, otherwise would have not been born. As I say, the Almoravids were not riding the wave of, uh, of some previous uh, migrations or invasions, whatever. They actually start literally from this uh, intensive uh, cultivation of the of the scriptures um, and of uh, tradition to inform their own uh, motivation um, in in an expansionistic di direction in an intolerant fashion. And so this, on, on the other hand, was the cause of which uh, eventually their their primitiveness uh, was so easily absorbed eventually in the same Spain that instead was a whole different thing with very advanced, you know, very rich, very very developed uh, and advanced urban cultures, you know, very uh, great amount of agricultural output and so on. And so, um, you know, these the, the great criticism, I don't know, to wine, this kind of uh, artistic or, you know, uh, rationalistic, allegoristic inquiry was, was cut off. The Almoravids literally burned manuscripts down because they thought, of, you know, think about all the great, uh, you know, Islamic art that, that had flourished in Cordovan times, had taken for them, uh, you know, the, the faithful astray, right, was uh, the destructive and, and, and negative and, and corrupt. And paradoxically, they, ended, they were the first ones who ended up corrupted uh, by the same, right? So it's always the same story. These troops arrive, they, they have, initially they're just a clan, right, or a tribe, and they, they manage to, to systematically subdue other areas, and there are other followers that are galvanized by the uh, by the jihad uh, mission and, and so they, they invade the richest place and however uh, at that point after the decline of the caliphate of Cordoba they um, you know th there wasn't much of a, of a real state uh, standing anymore right the thing had dramatically fragmented uh, privatized and so uh, the the actual way to control it was in a decentralized fashion that in the absence of, of this progress, of any progress, subtle experience or whatever, um, and any other motivation but the one of conquest, like the one of these Berbers was tradition had traditionally been for millennia, um, there couldn't be like much of a, on the longer run, a, a greater resistance. It doesn't matter how you know much they could co-opt and integrate, or cooperate with you know, with the local Iberians for that matter. An interesting aspect of the Almoravid government is that they never claimed a caliphal status. Uh, there is some debate, I think, for some princes, at least they, they, they assumed some uh, emerald prerogatives that, however, were usually at, uh, attributed to the caliphs, um, but never quite the caliphal title per se. They were emirs, right? And so I'm not really sure why this is the case. I think that in their rigid orthodoxy were still um, somewhat obsequious to the to the Abbasids uh, of Baghdad that detained still the, the caliphal title and this might have been just a way for obtaining uh, the, the recognition which I'm not you know of course um, of their power which I'm not I don't know probably it was uh, in an emerald sense would for, for a caliph would be would be okay in a way especially given that there was this there wasn't this need to you know to compete for the, the caliphal title itself um, this this contrast naturally with the Almohads that instead took on the for themselves the title of caliphs, and it's not that say between the twelfth and thirteenth, the eleventh and thirteenth century, the Basid caliphs were particularly, um, you know, uh, influent in an you know active political sense. This, they had already been taken over by the Seljuks. There was, um, you know, they they were more like a, a symbol um, of the. Islamic guide, and so even the fact that the same Seljuks kind of maintained the institution, didn't advocate it for themselves, uh, speaks of the, the the relevance that this had in Islam for the for the same Almoravids to mind. Right, this might have been a uh, just a part of the rigid traditionalism, and not much because of any other um, concern or need. After all, um, after you know, the, the, the collapse of, of the Cordoban Caliphate, there was just a matter of uh, ruthless competition for 
for domination. There wasn't much of a, it was a very local thing at that point. Um, there wasn't, um, let's say, by that point, like a, an idea, especially so far away from the Near East, from, from Mesopotamia, like the idea of, of, a, of an, even an antagonism of some sort, right? Back in the day, the Umayyads had done that because the Abbasids had usurped their own caliphate, right? So here, Sand was kind of a very different situation. And speaking of the Almohads, well, the, the movement had started in a very similar way. It was uh, the Mahdi, as if be essentially a messiah um, in the vest of a one of these other apostles, as these mm, uh, zealous Berbers that had traveled uh, in uh, in the advanced, you know, Islamic world, and had come back, let's say, influenced by some doctrines, including Sufism, at least, you know, the, uh, a mitigated form of it, etc., and had um, realized, say, the the importance of a deeper interpretation of uh, the scriptures of tradition um, in, uh, in, op in direct opposition and thus in criticism towards the Almoravid rule that at, at this point had basically taken over the whole region. So these were other uh, semi-nomadic tribes that had, uh, you know, had lived, of course, uh, had mm, uh, lived through the, the Almoravid wave and that, however, in North Africa, you know, couldn't really be forcibly brought under direct uh, control because there was no such thing again like a state. And the reason why the Almoravids cross into Spain is that they hope to organize something there on the base of of, of the ruins of of the of the Cordoban one. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 as we we're saying before, the the same forces that would come to make the Almoravid scramble emerge exactly from, from an area that once formally subjugated, also through very harsh wars sometimes, but still with, without this capacity of permanent control, began to, to agitate in this sense. And um, this, this Mahdi was um, uh, essentially preaching in uh, around uh, North Africa in, uh, and, and with different uh, fortunes, let's say, some cities accepted him, and their rulers too. Consequently, in other cities, he was he was instantly uh, kicked out because you know uh, he was again going against uh, the establishment. He was particularly accusing uh, uh, the uh, rigid Maliki traditionalism of the Almoravids to have discounted, of course, not just the value uh, for the sake of faith of a more perfect and deeper interpretation of the Quran and the Had. Uh, but um, let's say the, the paradox that exactly the literalistic, uh, fundamentalistic interpretation of the same would, uh, with, with an agnostic attitude towards anything else that couldn't quite be, you know, uh, that wasn't explicited by the same, was making the same Almoravids indulging into that uh, sin of, uh, you know, zoomorphism or uh, anthropomorphism that um, you, that uh, they had criticized themselves regarding to a uh, to to some interpretation of the, of the scripture where um, such metaphors are used and therefore if you are too literal about that paradoxically you will end up kind of buying the, the concept totally and not metaphorically and so obviously there is an interpretation uh, in the Quran and so on uh, that uh, deserves some attention so the Alma has were uh, here we're emerging. Uh, the Almohad um, uh, is, is a word instead that comes from Almohavidun, which fundamentally means uh, the followers of the unique God, to stress, in fact, the, the perfectly monotheistic, um, uh, you know, uh, faith of, of, the, of, of the followers in opposition to an alleged uh, still paganism. Um, that was, of course, the uh, the term used to criticize everybody in that sense. It was still, you know, erratical, and uh, in fact, not even am among the Almoravids we have to think that altogether all their followers or their chieftains that they had, you know, um, even the satisfactory Maliki uh, Maliki, uh, you know, 
indoctrination that would prevent them to from from mixing some pagan uh, customs into into their Islamic um, into their Islamic faith. Right, these peoples were fundamentally in a hybrid, like, having been converted from the the ninth century. So it was very recent. You can imagine what what this was like on the Atlantic from from the other side of you know of Africa, like you know very superficial. So again, this is what the same Muslims from 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 the Middle East be believed after all and um, and was a reality so um, the Almohads in this sense were promoters of a of a deeper understanding of um, of the scripture and consequently also making room for a rationalistic allegoristic um, interpretation of the same which embraced all another approach also to the arts the figurative ones and so on in fact the Almohads would leave in North Africa and in Spain uh, a much more impressive range of uh, art and architecture well also because of course they came later um, by so uh, the the their their power uh, during the 13th century was like uh, the rest of medieval civilization kind of more favored by by the circumstances like the world was richer was more developed um, and so there was also probably more moral and material resources to to work with but at the same time, as I was saying before, the Almohads that managed to take over um, the the Almoravid uh, Emirate and uh, beheading the the last uh, prince in the same Marrakesh, a very important symbolical uh, act, not, not just because of, of 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 the killing, but because of the of the conquest of of the capital of of the Almoravids and swarming to to Spain themselves um, and even managing to defeat the Christians at the Battle of Alarcos, a very important blow uh, to the Reconquista, um, uh, uh, was, um, let's say, a, a less proportional, right, in relative terms, a less prorompent movement. This had uh, been possible as usual, a bit like it had been in, in the Almoravid case, to the, uh, to the, the important uh, indoctrination that even here had been cultivated in the Atlas Mountains among these this, uh, Berber tribes who were quite warlike and they managed to, to channel this, uh, this effort towards a holy war and you know taking over the, the king Almoravid power. Um, it was actually not easy, right? The siege of Marrakesh was long, it was uh, you know, a very, you know, there were quite, quite uh, uh, important uh, episodes by scale. Um, however, the, say Almoravid power were never com was never completely taken out. Um, first of all, the um, for example the, the the Balearic Islands remained in the Almoravid hands, uh, from which uh, the Almoravids organized a landing in in Bohemia in in, uh, in Algeria that became uh, another hotbed of revolt against the same Almohavid control. For 40 years there was also famously a Kurdish um, a military commander who waged war um, against the, the Almohads for you know in different different allegiance. You can imagine the, the dramatic fragmentation also of the of the Berber interland and therefore all the forces that could you know as as these two once had managed but could could pop uh, out w w once again and creating disorder and so on so you can't really you know these peoples are all about guerrilla and uh, you know retreating into this into the mountains in areas that you don't really it's it's useless to, to wage like a, a war of invasion against because it's just mountains they have they don't basically have any strategic value um, but that they can always resume this prolonged effort and so also this this spirituality that we've seen uh, we've seen with the rebat with this um, uh, literally, the, the uh, Africa was not um, Northwest Africa was seen um, as a hermetic um, area, right, where you could really go into the wilderness and areas, so making this mystical experience, preparing for for the holy war, both mentally and physically. Um, a bit like you know, it was the the, the monastic military prerogative of the Christian orders in, in Europe, right? You know, they they would have to necessarily this this um the spiritual experience in order to perfect also their their military capacities were some interesting correspondences 
also military speaking in this regard and in the clash of the Reconquista with the various military orders that were created in Spain and, and you know the the, uh, the Arabs and this had something something relatively similar but of course the there were some differences uh, in many ways but never underestimate the intersections there because there was always some Christian fighting for the Muslims always some Muslim fighting for the Christians especially in such a highly fragmented um, situation um, anyhow the uh, the Almohads were crushed uh, uh, decisively at the, the Battle of, Navas, of, of Las Navas de Tolosa famously enough in 1212 this was one of uh, was yeah, I mean, surely by scale the greatest um, success of the Reconquista, at least tactically speaking, the, the, the most uh, clamorous uh, victory was a concerted effort, not just of Christian Iberia, but fundamentally the whole Christendom are under the guidance of Innocent III, um, the coordination of Papal Rome, the, 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 the efforts of the, the Crusaders come literally from all over Europe, they also contributed to settle themselves into this kind of literal far west that Spain was at this point when the when the uh, when the caliphal army was crushed as you know the wall andalusia was finally open it stood for the first time to the christians that uh, you know still as you know advanced gradually as you can imagine in the middle ages there are still so many fortresses scattered here and there but it was also the, the chance for adventurers come literally from everywhere in europe to to settle like as lords on their own as mercenaries as contractors would simply at some point go out there on their own form their own seigneury and then being integrated in whatever was Portugal Castile um, as local lords and creating also part of their historical um, of the local historical nobility and um, what is interesting as we we're saying before about the Almohads is that they instead called the uh, they took the the caliphal title for themselves calling the Abbasids as fundamentally as usurpers which is interesting because you know technically they, they could have been seen like that but from a rather anumayad perspective instead um, the the, Almoravid, uh, the Almohads at this point were seen you know themselves also something uh, less uh, like by the 13th century you know that, that it was the lowest of Abbasid power so uh, these were unavoidably Iberian and North African rooted powers was not much of a broader chance. Uh, it's true that the Almohads, compared to the Almoravids, kind of pushed eastwards more. Uh, they they took over even the Frequilla. They are their dominion stretched up to the uh, Sirte Gulf, right? But at the same time, we know what that meant, right? It was mostly a coastal, or better, you know, still a yeah, a coastal domination from from the interland. And uh, you know it was difficult to to outstretch power, in, especially in, in, in a direct sense to, towards towards at that point. Given all the issues that they had with um, with uh, also the Reconquista, that was always pressing and at that point mounting up, but with, with the um, with the with the revival of uh, Christian forces at the time, the Almohads remained some of the most prestigious of the uh, powers of the time especially you know it was definitely the the peak of berber uh, civilization advancement at least still considering that we are talking about a, a berber dynasty yes and an initial fall following of retinues essentially of north africans but still ruling from an iberian reality where you know still there was no you know the, ma the overwhelming majority of, of the population was local and the systems were local and so it was just as most of these phenomena like uh, an installation as kind of you know as the ruling class or the ruling elite and partly also some military uh, integration that is important um, in these systems that reinjected that level of combativity and war likeness that uh, was typical of these uh, tribal mountaineers right of the atlas that finally so these riches being o open to them right uh, with the promise of conquest so they, you got to give them credit for having properly envisioned the possibility of making it the fact that this passed through essentially a a, a religious faith um, and that they they managed to 
objectively scored that goal and also extensionally speaking that wasn't it was a uh, car it succeeded through an important amount of 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 military activity of you know effort of organization etc so and even actually from from the north african side this these ideas were also convincing we're able to uh, catalyze the, all these um, forces in towards a unitary direction and establishing um, uh, dynasties that at the end of the day ruled each for almost one century right so um, they they you know it wasn't completely uh, like irrelevant uh, and while however it seems even in here that the Almoravids were at least as individual rulers were kind of more effective while the Almohads after the first wave were you know ever you know softer less capable and less up to the levels of of the of the initial conquest right so that that idea that after all the system was secularizing this is interesting because we have talked a lot about the same the same issues happening uh during the migration era with with the steps in central asia we were just talking about the mongols recently enough i mean the world ages right the world grows and so uh, as we were also saying at the beginning of the video these waves fundamentally fundamentally stop yes the were the uh again other powers the the, the afsids taking over tunisia the marines taking over morocco um and so on and many other you know dom dominations that were you know quite as you can imagine quite uh uh, quite not even representable on a on a on a map politically, but you know consistent and uh, coexistent in, in within the systems, and um, and so mm, this was the the last phase of the great um, Islamic expansion from from northwest Africa, and um, and to the creation eventually of powers that uh, survived even during up to the modern age. Uh, at some point, um, same Marinids, then, uh, but even in Spain, I mean, think about the Nasrids um, of uh, of Granada, etc. But um, this happened still in a way when, you know, after Las Navas, the, the Christians had the upper hand, and so it would be just a matter of time before, you know, the Muslim Spain would, would fall. Right? It took actually a long time, more more than more than two hundred years yet, because um, the Iberian powers. That I mean, Christian Iberian powers at that point ha were more troubled by trying not to be conquered by each other rather than by the Muslims. Not were much of a threat. There were also some important connections with, uh, as we were saying before, the the Italians, for example, the Genoese that kept trading extensively in the area. Uh, they even supported at some point the the Emirate of Granada against uh, the the Aragonese in their struggle over the Western Mediterranean. Um, but still the situation kind of relatively relatively quiet down at least in terms of this gigantic waves that as you understand encompass also you know, various continents right this this idea that uh, you know by the 13th century we reached the peak of you know of medieval civilization and strengths and you know um, forces properly capable of molding the world it is reflected also by these berber ones right and after the, the the 13th century the, you, you have a you know a contraction of power even there and so internationally uh, there is probably not room for those demographic and economic and, uh, resources would allow even such individual um, religious experiences to take the you know again to go uh, to the adventure once again and managing to, to create literally other powers out of scratch right the same thing had been north africa had been the same place where i don't know the fatimids had had be, had originated and so uh it had been uh in uh, it's interesting you see with europe it's easy you you look at the east and you say you say more or less yes that's the the or the northeast that's where the the various ways of of primitive uh non-secularized people came to 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 push from and then eventually were absorbed themselves even when they managed to conquer uh, if you look at the Islamic world, the Maghreb, the Mashrek, and so on, altogether, it's a much more articulated and non-obvious geographical space. And yet, you gotta admit that North Africa, in this sense, as the more primitive area, still sent these waves of 
um, of, uh, of warriors and managed to take over ever greater system. So something that, um, except the Turks from Central Asia, right? In, in the Islamic world, you, you, you hadn't quite seen because not even the Arabs technically, uh, after the, fir the first waves were, you know, capable of, you know, competing with the, the, their own offspring in forms of, of the very powerful states created over the romano hellenistic I say, Byzantine Persian uh, legacy had, you know, could, could do anything again. So it's, um, that, that, that's fascinating. And, uh, and the Almohads uh, themselves, by having obtained caliphal power, um, at the moment of their uh, uh, of their their invasion from the 13th century, uh, the beginning of the 13th century, and so eventually degrading in power um, towards uh, during during the same, were however in uh, in competition not just with as we've seen the Abbasids in Baghdad, but also with the um, the Egyptians in Cairo. So even in a North African perspective, a Mediterranean one, it's still an interesting uh, duo to, to consider. So we will talk again about the Almoravids and the Almohads at some point who will make videos about their military organization and something more in-depth, um, or even just more in general uh, regarding their um, their their expansion, their affirmation. For today, I, I hoped that at least the the concept standing behind the the Maliki doctrine and how this was gradually, you know, it was how it was essentially instrumentalized and, and still criticized and perfected. Uh, you know that the Maliki school is still prevalent today in, in North Africa, fundamentally. Um, literally made uh, such huge movements, starting from again in individual tribes and managed to to expand dramatically and, you know, truly an evident moral force because in terms of pre-existing material base there wasn't quite anything much different from many other neighbors and other tribes that, you know, and peoples that could have done the same thing. Uh, in any case, for today we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.